If you were to just look at the stats, you'd probably think that Notre Dame had a great year on offense last season, but clearly it wasn't good enough for the Irish to achieve their playoff goals. This year, these five players could change all of that by having breakout seasons. That's next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. And today is Wednesday, June 12th. And thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer at Fox Sports. As always, you can watch the show on YouTube or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. If you are watching along on YouTube, reminder, like the video below and subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe there as well. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Okay, today I'm going to reveal my top five breakout candidates on the offensive side of the ball. Then on Friday of this week, I'm going to share who my top five breakout players are on defense. So there will be no new episode tomorrow, but I will be back Friday morning. Now let's get into it. And for the record, the way I look at a breakout player is someone who really has not contributed much on Saturdays up to this point. Someone who has not been a regular starter at any point in their career for an extended period of time, but I think will end up becoming some of the most impactful players on the entire team this season. So, for example, I think Jane Greathouse is going to have an excellent season this year as a true sophomore, but to me, it doesn't really qualify as a breakout season because he literally led the Irish in touchdown receptions last year. So he is not qualified, but these are the guys who are, and I'm going to go backwards five to one here. So we're going to start with number five. I think it's going to be left tackle Charles Jagasaw. Now he really has not done much in his career up to this point. He played in just two games last season during his freshman year, including one start against Oregon State in the Sun Bowl. And the fact that he did end up starting in that game was a big surprise because his only other appearance last season was against Stanford in the regular season finale when he got just five snaps at guard. Then Joe Walt declared for the NFL draft and opted out of the bowl game. And then all of a sudden, Charles Jagasaw was thrust in to the starting left tackle spot. Caught me by surprise. I think it caught a lot of other fans by surprise, especially when you think back to how Charles Jagasaw arrived to Notre Dame in camp. He suffered uh, a surgery, um, following his senior year before he got on campus in Notre Dame. And then when he got on campus, I'm just going to be honest, he was fat and out of shape and not the player that Notre Dame thought they were getting out of high school when he was a consensus high four-star recruit and Notre Dame's top commit in the, in their entire class. But when he came in in the Oregon State game, I watched this back actually not too long ago, I thought he was solid. He wasn't great. He wasn't terrible. He did give up one sack, and he allowed two quarterback pressures. But overall, I think when you consider the circumstances, he actually played pretty well in that game. So the reason I think he's going to break out is because there's really no competition for him at left tackle. And I don't mean that as sort of process of elimination. No, Marcus Freeman has come out and said, no, that job is secure. Charles Jagasaw is going to be the starting left tackle. And when you consider the uncertainty at right tackle, I think that means a lot. Because if you were to think back to this point last season, you're probably thinking, okay, this is probably going to be the last year that Notre Dame has Joe Walt. Who's going to be the left tackle next year? I think most people, myself included, would have assumed that it would end up being Emil Wagner. He has more of the typical left tackle body type. He can move more like a left tackle, especially with his footwork. But Again, Charles Jagsaw, even though a lot of people project him to play guard, he was listed as a tackle coming out of high school. Marcus Freeman called him a, quote, future great offensive lineman back in December, and Freeman actually made even more bullish comments about him lately. He made it clear that there was no question or concern about Jagsaw at left tackle. He was pretty open about the fact that there was a competition at right tackle, so again, I really do think that means something that Freeman would say this. And Now, I understand... If some people want to question that as coach speak, especially when you think back to the sack he gave up uh, against R.J. Oban, the Duke transfer in the spring game, he just got absolutely beat off the ball by a guy who we all think is going to be a really effective pass rusher at Notre Dame, who is also going to be in his sixth year of college football, whereas Charles Jagasaw is going to be in his second. Now, it's also been reported that Charles Jagasaw is a sponge. So even though he's really inexperienced as a player, I think he's constantly working on his game. He's watching film and has the dedication necessary to make a big jump from year one to year two at arguably the hardest position on the field outside of quarterback. So we know he's extremely talented. 
We know he has a great work ethic, and and we know why he was a top-ranked uh, commit in the class of 2023. So when you put all of that together, I feel like he is a great candidate to have a breakout season. Also, he's coming off that injury that I just mentioned, so he has a full year to really get back into shape, develop in a college weight program, and be ready to play come August when Notre Dame heads to College Station to play Texas A&M. So my official prediction for Charles Jagsaw, he is going to struggle at times, especially early in the year, but I think that he's going to develop enough by the end of the season to be one of Notre Dame's best linemen. All right, coming in at number four, I've got running back Jadarian Price. So when you look back at his career, it's been a little bit up and down because he was an early and early freshman um, back in 2022, and he's, he was one of the bright stars of spring practice. There were actually rumors that Jadarian Price was the best back on the team that also had Audrick Estime and Logan Diggs. I think Dylan McCullough was raving about him. He might have been the one who anointed him the most talented back. I don't know if it was publicly, but that's kind of what you were hearing privately. Then he tore his Achilles before he was able to play a single game in his freshman season, missed the entire year, and then came back in 2023, coming off that very serious injury. And I do not believe that he was 100% until about halfway through the year. Because even though he was out there playing early on in the season, had a touchdown in the season opener against Navy, When you recover from an injury like that, like a torn Achilles, I I really think it takes some time before you're back feeling like your complete, fully healthy self. Still, he made one of the biggest plays of the season last year with his kickoff return for a touchdown against USC, what all but uh, cemented that win for the Irish. So that was a great play. You saw his speed and his elusiveness on display there. And as a whole, he finished the season with 47 carries for 272 yards, which comes out to 5.8 yards per carries, which is really impressive. He also added three touchdowns on the ground and another one through the air as well. He was the leading rusher in the Sun Bowl with 13 carries, 106 yards, and a touchdown in a long 54. So he's shown enough already that makes you think, okay, Notre Dame has a real player here. He just needs more opportunities. And that's a big reason why I think he's going to break out this upcoming season. As much as I love Jeremiah Love, and I am definitely going to talk about him more on this episode, I think that Jadarian Price is the best pure running back on this entire team. Like I said, he's going to be fully healthy, has a full offseason under his belt since the injury. And even though I'm very high on Jeremiah Love, I think that Jadarian Price is going to benefit from having Love on the field, potentially at the same time. And I think the same goes for Jeremiah Love. Jadarian is definitely going to lead the team in carries, though, because he is that pure running back. I think he's going to be getting the ball in short yarded situations, especially now that we know that Jabron Payne is going to miss this entire season. There were times last year where I I feel pretty confident in saying this, that Jadarian Price was frustrated with the lack of carries that he was getting. But it's hard when Audric Estime is in front of you and you're also competing with another freshman or at least freshman in terms of eligibility in Jeremiah Love. I do not think that's going to be the case this year. I think he's going to get the ball plenty in this offense. I don't imagine we're going to see as much rotation among the running backs because even though uh, Audric Estime was the clear like workhorse running back for Notre Dame last year, there are a lot of guys getting in the mix. I think it's going to be mostly Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love. We're probably going to see the freshman and Neas Williams and Keaton Young a little bit, but it is going to be those two guys carrying the rock the most. Also, Mike uh, Mike Denbrock is a great offensive coordinator. He is going to get Jadarian Price the ball in advantageous situations. We know that he can catch the ball out of the backfield, and we know he can run it in between the tackles. He's big, he's fast, he's elusive, and I believe he's going to have a breakout season as the lead running back for the Irish. All right, coming up after this, we continue with my top breakout players on offense with a player who I believe is the next truly great Notre Dame tight end. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the tip off. And with great last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. Game three of the NBA Finals is tonight, so if you're in the Dallas area or you're just in Texas or anywhere close by and you're considering making a trip, To the game, Game Time is the perfect place for you. It is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat on your phone before you buy, but my favorite thing about Game Time is the pricing shows your total cost up front, and you can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Another player who I believe is going to have a breakout season now that they're fully healthy coming off a serious injury is junior tight end Eli Raritan. And that is why I have him at number three on this list. So let's take a look back at Raritan's career up to this point. 
There was a ton of hype around him coming out of high school. 24-7 Sports had him ranked as the number 57 overall player in the country and the number two tight end in his class. Plus, Raritan is from Iowa. So the fact that he picked Notre Dame over the hometown Hawkeyes was a huge deal, especially considering the fact that he plays tight end in Iowa Claims to be tight end you, even though we all know it's Notre Dame. We, maybe we can save that debate for another show. We are in the southern, uh, in the summertime, so maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll go deeper into why Notre Dame is the clear tight end you over Iowa and literally everyone else, but back to Eli Raritan. He suffered his initial ACL tear playing in a high school basketball game during his senior year, and then he sustained another ACL tear on that very same knee in October of his freshman year in 2022. And that was after he saw the field in five games. So it was a pretty remarkable recovery for Raritan considering he suffered the injury during his senior year of high school, was able to come back and actually play very early on in his career as a true freshman. And he was, at one point, it seemed like the number two tight end behind Michael Mayer. He was out there getting some reps. Then he suffered that other injury, wiped out the rest of his freshman season, and he did not come back to Notre Dame, or at least not on the playing field, until October of 2023. I believe that he might have been ready to go in case of an emergency at the start of last season, but Notre Dame really wanted to be cautious with him, considering it was his second ACL tear on that same knee. So he did not make his season debut last year until the Louisville game. But then he played the last six games of the season, including his first career start against Wake Forest once Mitchell Evans had suffered another ACL injury, or not another ACL injury for Evans, just another ACL injury in that tight end room. And in that game, in the game in which he made his very first career start, Eli Raritan caught a touchdown pass, and it was a really great moment for him in that game. So he hasn't really done much on the field for Notre Dame so far uh, at this point in his career, but I think he's going to break, or I think he's going to break out this season because, knock on wood, he has been healthy. He wasn't a full participant through spring practice, but I think. The real reason for that was because the coaching staff was being extra cautious with him. Mitchell Evans is out right now while he recovers from that ACL tear. And I feel like with Eli Redden, you just, you you know, he's a really talented prospect and you just want to make sure that he is fully healthy and ready to go at the start of this season. But any concerns about his health or if he was dealing with something that maybe the coaching staff wasn't talking about during spring practice, that kind of all went away immediately uh, once the spring game started because He was catching passes in the first drive of the game from Steve Angeli. He ends up scoring the first touchdown of that game. He was a force, especially in the red zone. Even though in that touchdown pass, he probably could have caught that ball a little bit more uh, clean on the first attempt, but still it bobbled it, made the catch, scored the touchdown, and it was clear that he was a force, and that is the reason why Angeli was just feeding him. So I believe that Mitchell Evans is going to be ready to go for that game against Sex A&M, but Raritan is going to see the field an awful lot, even if he's not the, the real starter at tight end in that game. He's still a great athlete despite the injuries. He's enormous. He's six foot seven, has the physique of a great tight end. He can still move around like a great player. And I think he's going to be an absolute mismatch in the red zone. One thing you hear about Mike Denbrock all the time is that guy loves finding mismatches on the field and exploiting them. And I feel like Eli Raritan, given his combination of size, speed, and hands, he is going to be a mismatch that Notre Dame is going to use a lot. So really excited about what Eli Raritan is going to do now that he's fully healthy. Okay, coming in at number two, I've got guard Billy Shrouth. He was another prize recruit coming out of high school. He was a top 150 player out of Wisconsin. So in the same way that it was a big deal grabbing Eli Raritan out of tight end you, it was a big deal getting uh, Billy Shrouth away from Wisconsin, his hometown state. But once Marcus Freeman was promoted to become that coach at Notre Dame, one thing that really stood out to me was the fact that his very first recruiting trip that he made, he got on that private jet, posted a picture about it, or maybe it was the... Yeah, it was Fighting Irish Media. They posted it. Marcus Freeman, Tommy Reese boarded that jet. They immediately went to Wisconsin, and the first recruit that they saw was Billy Shrouth. Clearly, he was a huge priority, and we're starting to see why. Billy Shrouth redshirted his freshman season, which is common and expected, but going into 2023, a lot of people thought he was going to be the starter at left guard. He was running with the ones throughout the spring practice session. You're like, okay, this makes sense. 
For some guys, usually they have to wait a couple of years, but maybe Billy Stroud is going to be a little bit ahead of schedule, and he was going to start at guard in his redshirt freshman season. But then Billy Stroud got beat out in camp by the elder Pat Coogan, and still, Billy Stroud appeared in every game at the start of the season last year, and then he assumed the right the starting right guard spot um, against Clemson after Rocco Spindler went down with a knee injury in that game. Then Billy Stroud started the last few games of the season, and I think when you go back and look at what he accomplished last year, he was a little bit more solid as a run blocker than a pass blocker, but still, he was effective overall. He only allowed two sacks and three quarterback hurries in 257 snaps on offense. But the reason that I am so confident about what he can do this season is partially because of what Marcus Freeman said about him last week when he was asked about potential breakout candidates on the roster. He mentioned Billy Stroud by name. That is a big deal. Also, it doesn't seem like he has any competition to be the starter at right guard. But Mark Freeman was pretty open about the fact that that left guard spot, that competition between Pat Coogan and Rocco Spindler, and considering Rocco Spindler started last season, the fact that there is a competition there, I think it says a lot. Pat Coogan, mind you, also is the only player on that Notre Dame offensive line that started every game last season. So you've got two starters last year competing at left guard, no competition for Billy Stroud at right guard. I think he has elevated his game to a whole nother level, and he is ready to have a breakout season. But don't just take my word for it. Don't just take Marcus Freeman's word for it. Take Harry He Stands, because Harry He Stand raved about Billy Stroud when he was a young player, even though he wasn't really making a dent on the field. You could see, or you could tell, what Harry He Stand saw in him based on the way that he talked uh, about Billy Stroud. And if you know anything about Harry He Stand, he's not a guy who's just giving compliments out for free, right? Like if he says a player is really good, he means it. That is a guy who has seen and coached a lot. And I mean a lot of future NFL greats on the offensive line. So to me, that means more than anything. And I feel like now that he has two years under his belt, he's got two years of a college weight program uh, with him, and he has really developed his body and his game to a level where he's going to be what I believe is the best offensive lineman on the team next year. So really excited about what he can do for this team because there's a lot of questions about the offensive line. To me, I have zero questions about Billy Stroth. I think he's going to have an absolutely huge year at right guard. Okay, so those are four of my breakout candidates on offense in 2024. But my number one, the player who I am most confident will have a truly great season, is coming up right after this. Okay, number one for my top breakout candidate on offense in 2024 is running back Jeremiah Love. And this really shouldn't be that much of a surprise because, as I mentioned about Billy Shrouth, when Marcus Freeman was asked about potential breakout candidates in 2024, yes, he did mention Billy Shrouth. But the first player he mentioned was Jeremiah Love, and I think that's for a great reason. Last year, we started to see why Jeremiah Love was such a prized recruit coming out of high school. He was one of Notre Dame's biggest wins on the recruiting trail in a really long time because he plays a position that Notre Dame traditionally does not recruit super, super well. Like, they have had great running backs come through the program, certainly with Kyron Williams and Audrey Estime, but... Jeremiah Love was a consensus top 75 recruiter, top 80 recruit, top five running back in the class. Alabama wanted him with Nick Saban there. Texas A&M was willing to throw big, big money bags at him. And still, Jeremiah Love picked Notre Dame. And Jeremiah Love was also at the Marshall game. And I think he was at the Stanford game as well. I know he was at the Marshall game. And uh, I believe that Chad Bowden actually took him in the golf cart away from the stadium during the fourth quarter, probably because he's like, man, he can't see this. If Notre Dame ends up losing this game, there's no way we get this elite running back prospect. But despite all of that, Jeremiah Love ended up at Notre Dame, and boy, was that a big win for the Irish. He was good enough to play as a true freshman in a loaded backfield that had Audrey Estime. Uh, Jeremiah Love had his best game of the season in Notre Dame's most important game of the season last year. It was Ohio State. Love had eight carries, 57 yards, and he was just so impressive in that game. It wasn't just his running ability once he got out in the open field that he could make guys miss. He ran the ball so hard in between the tackles. It really caught me off guard. I had to like double check to make sure that it was Jeremiah Love getting those carries. Like, wow, he's really making some plays against a really, really good Ohio State defense. He was Notre Dame's second leading running back last year with 385 rushers, and I think he was just scratching the surface of what he could become because he really didn't get that many carries because Notre Dame had Audrey Kesame. So, as I mentioned, Marcus Freeman said he's very confident that uh, Jeremiah Love is going to be the breakout player this year, but I think there's a lot more that goes into it. We know that Jeremiah Love is absolutely loaded with talent. He has elite athleticism that is really, really hard to find for any program in the country and certainly for Notre Dame. 
He's extremely fast running the ball downhill. He can accelerate so quickly. He has great footwork, and he just has these natural abilities that you really can't teach. It's like that jump cut when a running back just instinctively is able to move his body from point A to point B, and the defender just can't see it coming, and he does it so quickly that the defender truly has no chance of getting him. I think Kyron Williams was truly elite at this. He would be running through the holes, and he's already a little guy who is low to the ground, and he would make these jump cuts, and you'd be like, wait, how did he even get there? Right? Like he was just here and now he's over there. Like Jeremiah Love has that ability in his game. And I also think that a big reason why that Jeremiah Love is going to have such a great season, you know, in addition to his natural ability, is offensive coordinator Mike Denbrock. When I was talking about Eli Raritan earlier, I mentioned how Mike Denbrock loves mismatches. Love is a mismatch machine because he can line up anywhere on the field. He can line up like a traditional running back in the backfield. He can also line up in the slot and catch passes. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah Love was working with the receiving core during spring practice um, in the slot. He was catching passes, running routes, and I don't think he's going to play that position long term. But still, it shows, one, that he's capable of doing that, and two, it shows a level of trust with from the coaching staff because they're like, look, Jeremiah Love, we know what he can do at running back. These reps that are extremely valuable, especially in spring practice when you only have 15 total practices, they're like, look, rather than having him continue to do drills with running backs, we want him to expand his game and work with the wide receivers so that he can do more things for the offense this season and he can be more of a threat. And you can also get Love and Jadarian Price in the field at the same time, which, as I mentioned earlier, could be really beneficial for both guys because now you've got Jeremiah Love in the slot against a potentially loaded box, and you put a linebacker on him in coverage, good luck, man. (laughs) Like, that dude has absolutely no shot of covering Jeremiah Love. To me, Love is like a faster Donovan Edwards, the running back from Michigan who, um, you know, had that huge game in the national championship, also had a huge game against Ohio State the year before when Blake Corum was out with an injury. Like, Donovan Edwards is a big play machine. He has great downhill speed, but what makes him so effective is he can also uh, really catch passes out of the backfield and he can line up out wide. I remember this game. I believe it's Michigan versus Purdue, and, you know, I get it. Purdue is in the best defense of the world. But Donovan Edwards ran out. And he was split out wide uh, against the defense. And Purdue had a linebacker on him. And they were like, you know what? We're just going to run a fade to Donovan Edwards. Caught it in stride for a touchdown. It's like, how many running backs could actually do that? How many offensive coordinators would feel comfortable putting their running back split out wide, even though it's a linebacker going up against him and actually make a throw to him down the field? There's very, very few running backs in the country that can do that, and I think that Jeremiah Love has that capability. We haven't seen it yet, but I think we're going to start to see that this season. As I said, Marcus Freeman said the first guy that he said was Jeremiah Love. And last year, the guy that Marcus Freeman was raving about throughout the offseason and said he was going to break out was Xavier Watts, and we all saw what happened there. To be honest with you, I think we only have two years left of Jeremiah Love in an Notre Dame uniform. I think he's that special. I think he's going to be off to the NFL after next season. And even though that's not a ton of time with Jeremiah Love, if he's leaving after three years of the NFL, that means he had an outstanding career for the Irish. And I am very, very excited about what he can do this season and beyond. Kyron Williams and Audric Estimate were great running backs. To me, Jeremiah Love is going to end up being a better weapon than both of those guys because he can do so many different things. I'm not saying that Jeremiah Love is going to be a better pure running back than Kyron Williams and Audrey Kesame, but considering what he's capable of doing, considering all the different options that he provides for the offense, I believe that he is going to be a weapon that we haven't really seen in a long time. Someone that I would compare to Golden Tate because Golden Tate could run the ball, he could catch the ball downfield, he could catch the ball uh, in the screen game, he could do it all, and then once that ball was in his hands, he was always a threat to score, and that is exactly what I see in Jeremiah love. I can't wait to see what he can do this season. And like Kyron Williams, I think we're going to see it right out of the gate. I expect Jeremiah Love to have a big game against Texas A&M in the season opener. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making Lockdown Irish your first listen of the day. As a reminder, I will be back on Friday to reveal my top five breakout candidates on the defensive side of the ball. In the meantime, please subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast and give us a follow on social media. I'll talk to you soon.